We're continuing today on number two of the message we started last week on what are your expectations? What are your expectations? Good question to ask. Father, we thank you for your spirit in this place today. We, we love the opportunity to acknowledge and worship and give praise to you today in this house. And we thank you, Lord, for everyone that has joined us today. Make it real to our hearts as we go into your word. Make it alive as your spirit does. And we thank you in Christ's name. And everybody said, what are your expectations? Uh, one definition of expectations is a expectant mental attitude. An ex expectant mental attitude. So the synonyms for expectations, anticipation, hope, trust. What did you anticipate with your life when you were younger? I had uh, my first public school, high school that I spoke at, I was 23 years old. Man, and I was so skinny of a little fella. I'll tell you the truth. I felt a little self-conscious. Now I'm self-conscious the other way. You just can't win, can you? But uh, at 23, I spoke to the local high school. Miraculously, I went and told the principal that I could do some good, I thought. And he said, well, where's your church at? Well, our church happened to be close to the railroad track. And he kind of rolled his eyes when I told him. <laughs> but uh, I said, but, you know, I, I saw that he was a little condescending about that. And I said, well, but let me tell you something, Mr. Principal. Call him by his name. I said, uh, my church is not in the best location, but that has nothing to do with me. I came here to help that church, and I have something to give. And I believe before this week's out, you're going to call me. And I left it with his mouth open as I walked out the door. Got it two days later, he called me and said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but you got an assembly program. And then I was scared to death. I'd never spoken to more than 30 people. And, but anyway... Uh, I had an expectation when I was young that somewhere in my ministry I would have the opportunity to further that and uh, it, that happened while as we were in Pinehurst uh, a corporation uh, wanted to fund me to go do programs in public schools and this corporation provided me, a, gave me a car a telephone, not hardly anybody had telephones, it was amazing to have a car phone all, all built into the car and um, I started doing public schools from here to California. I was I was doing 300 times a year speaking, and uh, that's a lot of speaking. There's only so many days in a year. I would speak four and five times a day in public schools. I would beat kids around, slap them around, do all kinds of funny stuff, and give them a message on anti-drug, motivation to life. That was an expectation that I had, and God helped me to fulfill that. And I, I had that expectation that that first school that I did when I was 23 years old. All of us here today have had expectations when we were younger, and some of those expectations were fulfilled in our lives. Some of us were able to do things that we thought of and that we anticipated we might would do in our life, and there's a lot of things we didn't know that we wind up doing, but that's okay. Those were good things too, surprises. In Luke 3.15, and all the people were in expectation, looking for the Messiah, is what it's speaking to. In fact, they were debating among themselves, John, could John the Baptist be the Messiah? And he let them know that he was just the one that would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And... But they were in expectation. I told you last week, NEB translation says, they were on their tiptoes of expectation. I thought that was kind of interesting. Suspense is another word that was used in one translation. 
And all the people were in expectation. It tells us that at that time, people were looking for the Messiah. It was just something they were looking for and expecting. I mean, people had the portions of the Scripture of the Old Testament and the prophets that gave prophecies, hundreds of prophecies concerning the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, or God curse be upon him, one rendition says. And then it finishes out with an Aramaic word that's only found in this one place in the Bible. Maranatha, the Lord comes. Wow, when I, when I think about that term, that Aramaic term, Maranatha, the Lord comes, it leads us to our first point, and I'm reviewing just a little bit of last week's, but there's a lot more out there in the foyer of last week's message if you do not have the copy of that. It's for you in the foyer there. The church has expectations. And we'll just talk of a few verses concerning that to review. 2 Peter 3, 14. Seeing that we look for such things. We're talking about and referring to the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be in peace without spot, blameless, diligent. 1 Thessalonians 5 eight. be sober, be serious, putting on the faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. The Bible speaks of putting that helmet on on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Put that helmet on. It'll protect the way you think. It'll protect your mind. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people trying to tell you what to think and how to think. you got to put on the helmet of salvation. Mark 13, 33. Take heed. Watch. Pray. Speaking of vigilance. That's what we need to, that mindset is what we need in this time. Mark 13, 33, take heed, watch, watchfulness, vigilance. But in the meanwhile, the scripture also says, while we're being sober, serious, putting on faith and love, putting on the helmet, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Praise God for that. Deliverance. And the meanwhile, in Luke 19, 33, he says, stay busy. God's people should be the busiest people on the earth. Meanwhile, occupy till I come. Stay busy. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is never in vain when you do it for the Lord. Come on. It's true. I love that passage. I had a lady in my church in Pinehurst that she was a little Swedish lady, Hilda. And she was amazing. She would work with her fingers and her hands and do afghans and sewing and pillows. She started a worldwide ministry of many, sending greetings to missionaries all over the world, letting know that she's praying for them. And pretty soon the post office had to send a special truck to her little apartment because all these missionaries writing back to her, saying, yeah, pray for me. And this woman was amazing. She, in her 80s, she started that when she was 80, writing to missionaries all over the world and praying for them. And then she started a, a prayer thing a couple years later, getting people to intercessory prayer. Um, I finally put her to rest when she was 90, and I, I had to look in the casket to make sure she was still resting because she was one motivated lady, buddy. Hilda, Swedish, Swedish accent she had. She got, when she was in her 70s, from 70 to about 85, about every couple of times a year she'd go in the hospital. She's supposed to be dying. But she'd go in there and lead a bunch of the nurses to Christ and then go home. It was amazing. She had an incredible ministry. I, I, I go up and check on her. She'd wink at me and say, I'm doing good. And I led two, two nurses to Christ today. Hilda, she just had a way of doing things. She was always busy doing God's work. 
man, she was amazing. She fulfilled 1 Corinthians 15, 58. No question about it. The church, we are the church. You can't point and say the church and then divorce yourself because you are the church. We are the church. The church, which we are, that we make up, should be filled with incredible expectation. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Come on, church. Wake up. It's time to get excited. We're living in very exciting times. The nation of Israel, the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish people have an expectation. A little bit of recap from last week. Our hopes, the Messianic hope, and the blessed hope runs concurrently. The Israelis and us are on the same time schedule. We're both looking for the same Messiah. Now the scripture that Paul gives us in Romans 11, 12. Now if the whole world became rich as a result of God's offer of salvation, when the Jews stumbled over it and turned it down, if the Gentiles had been enriched by their default, think of how much greater a blessing the world will share in later on when the Jews also come to Christ. Come on. David Jeremiah speaks of that a little bit later. We'll talk about that. Israel's expectation will be realized at the end of the age, according to what Paul says here. And David Jeremiah, in reading some of his commentary, he said he struggled with this verse for years that all Israel will be saved. His explanation and commentary goes like this. The only Jews who are left will be those who believed in who received the Messiah during the tribulation time. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, Christ, and shall turn away the ungodliness of Jacob. The righteous nation of Israel will go into the millennium with Jesus Christ as king. What an expectation. Come on, people. We were in Israel a few years ago, and I can just see the great thing that God is going to do one day with those Jews that look upon him whom they had pierced, and he will be their Messiah. They will no longer look to the law, but they'll look to grace, and they'll look to Christ. The nation of Israel and the Jewish rabbis and the Jew Judaism, those of the faith of Judah, Judaism, have an expectation of a Messiah. As we look for the second coming, some of them look for the first coming. The world has an expectation too. Sin has corrupted so many in government. Mankind is worn out with corruption and broken promises. I'll tell you the truth, it's getting very discouraging at times. The nations of the world are desperately looking for leaders with answers. There's a lot of things going on and a lot of problems that need answers. This leadership vacuum, and this is the way I feel God spoke it to me, this leadership vacuum will ultimately set the stage for a charismatic world leader who will emerge and fulfill those expectations. I mean, those that there are, there are need for answers in our world. But I want to tell you something. There's no answer that is left out of the Word of God. The Word of God has the answer, and the Word of God is the answer for the world today. Amen. We spoke of that in, this, in the worship time, didn't we? This leadership vacuum, this charismatic world leader will emerge and fulfill those expectations. He has been referred to as the man of sin, the Antichrist, or instead of Christ, or another Christ. The spirit of this man, the spirit of lawlessness, is already at work in the world today. And can everybody agree with that? The world is primed and ready for his debut. And in my heart of hearts, I believe it could be rather soon. And if his debut is soon, and if you happen to take the position of a pre-tribulation rapture, that means that things are moving very fast. Satan hates Israel. 
because it is from the nation of Israel that the Jewish Redeemer was brought into the world. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Satan did everything in his power to destroy him, even the de destroying the seed of women. He'll try, hell will try one more time at the end of the age by presenting to the world another Christ. It's amazing how people will reject the Son of God, the Messiah, but they'll fall for another Christ. That's amazing. And the, in Thessalonians, the word goes, if you don't love the truth, then you're going to be so you're going to be seduced by a lie. How many believes it's important to love the truth? This imposter on the back of your sheet, this imposter will play to the inner hunger of mankind and the world. He will present himself as God, the one with answers, hypnotizing the human race with lying wonders, miracles, and worship of self-exaltation. He will do more damage, produce more grief, break more hearts, raise more hell than all the despots before him. The good news is he won't last long. I said, the good news is he won't last long. The Lord will destroy him by his breath and the brightness of his coming. Now, I've heard of bad breath, but I'm telling you, that is some kind of bad breath. The Lord, by his breath and by his brightness of his coming, will destroy this man of sin. Man, yes. Haggai 2.7 says, Jesus is the only desire of nations. Come on. Jesus alone is the desire of nations, Haggai the prophet. He who is the true answer for the world today, the only answer. And Isaiah saw it in chapter 11, verse 9. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Come on. I mean, I look into that day. Wow. I says the world has expectations too. It's, it will be deceived by another Christ, but also there is the expectation also that the earth will be filled with the glory and the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How many knows that the earth is covered by two-thirds water? Oh, man, the glory of God covering as the waters cover the sea. Creation has expectation as well. For the earnest expectation of the creature or creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For creation was made subject to vanity. Paul said, for creation was made subject to vanity. Adam's fall signaled the fall of creation. For we know that the whole creation. Everything has been affected by Satan's rebellion and Adam's fall. We know that, don't we? Groans and travails. All of creation groans and travails in pain together until now. The longing of the elements of creation to be brought back to their original perfection. Dave Wilkerson has always said over the years in his ministry that the things that are happening in the earth and the climate and the environment is like earth, like giving birth and the earth pains and the, like a woman giving birth to a child is his analogy was given. We hear so much about climate change and a man's so-called carbon footprint affecting the ozone layer, the CO2s that protect the earth's surface affects the ozone. Again, Paul said creation was subjected to vanity. Of course, we want to do prudent things to protect the environment, but millions of electric cars are not going to save this planet, people. And there is not much debate. There is climate change. 
But the big debate is, is it man's footprint, man's involvement, or is it just cycles of time and space? At the, I was flying to Alaska to preach a tour of Alaska, and I was flying maybe six months or maybe a little bit less than that after Mount St. Helen blew, and we were flying right over top of where it blew. And they said at the mouth of Mount St. Helen when it blew, that at the mouth of the eruption, the megaton force was 70 times greater than all the nuclear arsenal on the earth that exists. Take all the nuclear arsenal, nuclear power plants, nuclear everything, all the nuclear on the earth. At the mouth of the eruption, the megaton force was 70 times greater than all the nuclear arsenal of the world. And man, man, these people that push the climate change thing thinks that man get rid of the steaks and the cows and have electric cars. And people don't think about this very good. How are you going to charge the electric cars with the energy that you get from the, you know, fossil fuels? If it ain't blowing the wind, you don't have the windmills working too good. I mean, you got to think this stuff through a little bit. I don't think some of them think it through very good. There must be, and this is on your nose, there must be a regeneration of the earth by the original builder, God. Amen. The earth must be reborn. Labor pains have already begun. The earth is heathing with earthquakes and volcanoes in numbers never imagined. I had Joe look this up. Over 400% increase over the decades of these eruptions. And it's incredible. And Dave Wilson said, it's like labor pains. A woman fixing to give birth. The earth fixing to give birth. A rebirth. Think about it. And there will be a renovation. A new heaven and a new earth brought under divine order. And the curse will be lifted. And it says in Isaiah eleven six, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the goats, and the calf, and the young lion with the fatling together with the grown cow. And a child shall lead them. Come on. The regeneration of mankind will be followed by the regeneration of this earth. Oh, man, when John and I had the privilege to go across country, we were like a bunch of teenagers. We had T-shirts and blue jeans and Diet Coke. We was ready to go. And um, I told kids that in public school that we had our six packs of Diet Coke and we headed across country from ocean to ocean. We spent days in the in the beautiful Grand Canyon, and what a beautiful place it was! How oh, amazing! There's some beauty on this earth that is amazing, but God's going to have to renovate it. He's going to renovate it, and uh, it's going to be an amazing thing. And Earth is going to be one of our places we're going to hang out. We'll have the the heaven. We'll have the New Jerusalem. That's what she Nancy Lee's waiting on the New Jerusalem. She don't want to fly to the new one now. She wants to fly to one then and be there for that one. <laughs> But creation has an expectation. Jesus has expectations. Come on. Portions of John 17, 21 to 24. That they all may be one as you and I, Father, are in me. Jesus prays for unity among believers. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them that they might be one even as we are one. Communion, purpose, and glory. Jesus expects us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. If we're going to be his disciple. Jesus expects for us to follow in his steps. The famous book, Shelton, what will Jesus do? You ask yourself that. Jesus expects for us to believe in him. John 14, Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and bring you to myself that where I am, you will be also. Come on. Yes. We're talking about expectations here today. 
God has expectations as well. We are to love God with all of our heart. We just sang that, didn't we, Mr. Ed? We love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. These two, from the Ten Commandments, Jesus has narrowed it down to two. The, the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, they made 10,000 rules out of the ten, but Jesus just made two out of the ten. Love God, all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor yourself. And all the, all the promises and all the commandments rest on these two. Come on. And on this Mother's Day, I, I didn't word it quite right. On this Mother's Day, that's when you have to honor your mother. And the rest of the days, you don't have to. That's not what we meant there. <laughs> we didn't quite mean it that way. But we were running out of canvas, and we were just kind of trying to fit it in the best we could. But on Mother's Day, we are going to honor the father and our mothers today, the mothers, Exodus 20, 12. We do that every day of the year. My sister, she was young, and she was a little bit misbehaving. She's my older sister. The only two of us are the last standing in the family. And she said, well, I'd have, they, you, need to, you need to love us because you wouldn't have got here. Well, I'd have got here some Somehow, she says, somehow, I'd have got here without you. And my, they were trying to figure that out for a number of years later. Remember, mom turned upside down spells wow. <laughs> Try that. Just flip up mom and turn it upside down. It says wow. Mothers, wow. Come on. Happy Mother's Day. And it's true. Listen, if you look down, you'll see the earth. If you look around, you'll see earthly things. And they're all getting burned up, aren't they? Looking up, we see the hope of the soon coming return of the Lord Jesus Christ. To those who are discouraged, make your cry, Maranatha. To those who are worried, make your cry, Maranatha. To those who are filled with anxiety, make your cry, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. It's time for the church to cry out. In the times of the biblical days, they had a greeting, and the greeting was Shalom, or Ichthus. Ichthus, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, Lord. And they'd right do the little sign of the fish with their little sandals in the sand. Do the sign of the fish, Ichthus, God, Jesus, God, God, Savior, Lord, Son. And then they had Shalom, which is peace. But then with the oppression of the Romans and things were getting pretty hard, pretty hot and heavy, the new greeting was when they would greet each other, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Don't you think it's time for the church to start crying out, Maranatha, Jesus is coming again. Let's stand together and rejoice in the Lord.